God created this for man. Man created this for God. Community Christian Church, 1944 South Jackson Street, Frankfort, Indiana. Come join us.
God, we're thankful um, that we are yours and yours alone. That our identity is not found in an elephant or a donkey or, or red or blue. Our identity is found in you and in your son, Jesus Christ. We are yours and yours alone. And God, this, um, this week has been crazy. And there's so much that's weighing on many of our minds. And it's a reminder to us, God, that we belong to you and you alone. Thank you, God, for your love, for your grace, for your mercy, for your forgiveness that not only do we enjoy and are grateful to be recipients of, but God, that same Love and grace and mercy and forgiveness is for all. And so God, let us not just be recipients of it, but let us be distributors of it as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, I want to, uh, I want to begin today by giving credit where uh, credit is due, IU won again last night, or won again yesterday. Uh, Dan, Cindy, this is for you. Uh, they beat Michigan. But I just want to say, now that Penn State is 0-3, that win over Penn State doesn't look very good anymore. But that's okay, because... Purdue, uh, as well, stayed undefeated yesterday. Thank you. Wisconsin would rather be sick than play Purdue. That's right. Wisconsin would rather be sick than play Purdue. <laughs> that's good. Um, it, 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 it's been a crazy week, hasn't it? Um, 
many of you all know, some of you all do not, um, back in September I took a part-time job with the school system as their COVID assistant. And so I track a lot of the, the COVID data, particularly for the staff, but I also monitor um, uh, student uh, data and positives and days off and who comes back when. And, and, and it's been a crazy week. Um, and at the end of the week, I sent an email to uh, all of the principals in our schools and all of uh, the nurses, and I said, hey, it's been a week, and we know it. It's been crazy for you all, um, and I just want to say thank you. you know, our teachers would rather be educating than contact tracing. Um, and a lot of that boils down to, um, to me, to us as non-students, as non-school employees, doing what we need to do to help out those uh, who, are, um, who are working in those schools by taking the necessary steps uh, to mask uh, when we're out and about, to, to keep our distance. Um, and not because we don't want to hug, because, man, I want to hug. I, I, I had two funerals yesterday, uh, one for our dear friend Mary Cunningham, and, I, and I'm going to admit right now, I gave Gordon a hug. Um, just because, you know, he, he, he's one of ours. And we love Mary uh, and how uh, heartbreaking that was. Um, and, and it's hard for those of you. I, I know it's hard for those of you who've lost loved ones during this. Uh, and I think what it does is it puts uh, even more of an onus on us to, to take it seriously um, and, and to do what we can uh, to, to, we're not, I told Joan earlier, we're not going to eliminate the virus, but we can do our part to slow the spread of the virus. And so um, th that's just my PSA, public service announcement for the day, not my, that's not a PSA, a prostate screening uh, <laughs> number. Um, <laughs> wow, uh, that did not go in that direction. Uh, that's not what I anticipated. <laughs> public service announcement for y'all. Um, we, we're still running through this series entitled Formed uh, and looking at spiritual disciplines and spiritual practices. Last week we talked about choosing to say yes to, to those things that will encourage our growth through time in prayer, through, through time um, uh, choosing to do those things that draw us into, into God's presence more personally and, and even collectively because sometimes it's that collective that brings us into God's presence as well. And this week, I want to look in particular at a, at a verse, um, because we can't always plan and say everything is going to go according to this schedule. Everything is going to happen in this way in regards to my spiritual growth, because like we said last week, if it did, it would look like this straight line trajectory. We'd constantly be growing. But we know, because we've lived it, uh, see, I just spit right out there. And so six feet, people, six feet. Um, our, our spiritual growth looks more like this. We all have our ups and downs. We all have our valleys. And that's why it's important, as I said earlier in my prayer, that, that we are examples of that grace and forgiveness because we've gone through those dips in our faith. And we've had those high moments. And we can look at people and say, well, they're just terrible backsliders. No, because we've done that too. And so we have to be known as a people of love and grace and forgiveness. Uh, and I want to look at a verse that I think... But we can't plan on, on this. We plan for this. And so we look at a verse in Romans chapter 8, a well-known verse. Many of you all could probably quote it with me. But in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, uh, many translations say something like, God causes everything to work for good. You know, and we know that God works all things to work together for good for those who love him or are called according to his purposes. Um, some translations say he causes everything to work for good, which to a lot of people suggests that God causes everything. You know, and, and everything includes war, it includes marital unfaithfulness, it includes, it includes pets dying, and, and, and it includes minutia. If, if we look at it like that, God causes everything. And when we buy into this perspective, we are left trying to find satisfactory answers to questions like why God caused them, that, that young lady, to be raped. Or why did God cause my brother to be paralyzed from his, from his birth? 
See, Jesus never once suggested that afflictions that people were facing were caused by God. In fact, at one point, his disciples said, hey, look at this guy. Who caused him to be born this way, him or his parents? And Jesus is like, seriously? There's no answer to that. Jesus never once suggested that the afflictions that we as human beings face are caused by God. In, in fact, he was outspoken against that mindset. And his perspective was that afflictions were from Satan. They were from the enemy, not God. And Jesus was, instead, Jesus himself was out to set people free from their afflictions. See, this idea that God causes is one possible translation of the original Greek text found in Romans chapter 8. But it's not the only possible translation. And it's not one that really aligns with the message of Jesus when the context of the verse is also considered. Because the original Greek word that has sometimes been translated causes is a combination of two words. The prefix of, of which means with or alongside of, and the root word means to exert energy. So the idea that to exert your energy alongside another. In other words, an accurate translation should convey that there's more than one party involved and exerting energy. And what it does is it leads to a fundamental problem with translating that passage to communicate that God is causing everything. But a more accurate translation might be to say that God works with us. He works alongside us. Always to bring about good in all things. And that makes it sound a little bit different, doesn't it? Because when those terrible, those things that in life happen that, that hurt us, it's not that God caused it, but that God is walking alongside us to bring about good out of that situation. See, there's been a strong theological bias since oh, about the 5th century A.D., that if God is, is all-powerful, he, if he's omnipotent, if he is omniscient and, and all-knowing, then he must also be all-controlling. You know, by that point in history, Christians had, had already started thinking that power means control. But is power and, and control what Jesus taught? That's the opposite of what Jesus taught. Jesus taught and modeled power under an attitude of self-sacrifice, an attitude of humility and servanthood. That's how Jesus used his power to bring about good. You know, whether the afflictions that he confronted were caused by Satan or just caused by people's bad decisions and choices, Jesus used his power to come alongside of, to come alongside the afflicted and together with them to make good come out of that affliction. In the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul says that those who are perishing, to those who are perishing, the cross of Christ looks like foolishness. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, a guy getting crucified probably looks weak on the face of things, doesn't it? You know, Paul is pointing out that the revelation of God in Jesus is redefining what it means to be all-powerful. It doesn't look like a controlling over everything. Instead, it looks like the ability to overcome any evil and to bring good out of it. I, I, I've said this a lot of times that, that in the, um, that, that old hymn says, he could have called 10,000 angels to take him down off that. He could have just said, you know what, I'm done with this. He could have. He had that power. But he didn't use that power to control he used his power to show humility, to show self-sacrifice, and to show that, that the, way, the way of Jesus isn't to, to conquer through force. The way of Jesus was to conquer through love. See, it's power in relationship that honors and respects the power of the other. And it works with others and, and it influences them rather than coerces them or, or oppresses them or forces them. 
And when we read Romans 8, 28, that well-known verse, you know, when we read it from that perspective, then it's perfectly compatible with the life and the teachings of Jesus. And this passage is telling us that no matter what happens in life, no matter how much God may even be opposed to it ever happening in the first place, He will be right there with us, in it, working alongside us to overcome the affliction, whether it's self-imposed or whether it's circumstances imposed, God is working alongside us to bring about good in this world. And out of God's incredible love for us, he dives right into the mess with us. You know, I think he tried. It, it may sound weird. He, the, the, it seems like the Old Testament was that power control thing, wasn't it? The law. You guys have to measure up to this. And I'm going to coerce you. And if you don't, if you touch the slightest touch to the Ark of the Covenant, boom, I'm going to smite you down. And that happened. But the neat thing about Jesus is that out of God's incredible love for us and realizing that there's no way that any of us can attain that, can meet the law to its fullest degree, he dives into the mess with us, not judging us, but redeeming us. You know, the great thing about John 3.16 is that there's a verse 17. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Yes. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But to save the world through him. To redeem the world. See, the passage uh, in Romans 8 says that God does this for all who are called according to his purpose. So you might ask, why doesn't God do this for everybody? Well, the answer is simple. He, he does. He wants to. But I got to tell you, sometimes working alongside, exerting energy alongside of or not over someone requires our cooperation, doesn't it? It requires our participation Paul is simply pointing out that as foolish and as weak as a, as a crucified king might appear to be to an unbeliever, that very power comes alongside us in our afflictions. And to overcome them is not weak in any way to those who love him who are called according to his purpose. In other words, it's not that God will only work with some people, it's that only some people choose to work with God. And sometimes... Sometimes those people who are choosing to work with God may not be sitting in the seats on Sunday mornings. And sometimes the people sitting in the seats on, on Sunday mornings are those who are choosing not to work with God. Because, well, I've got my ideas to what God's already going, wanting to do. See, it's only those people who understand and trust God that are, willing to, that are going to be willing to work with Him to bring about good out of evil. And when we see and understand that what God was doing on the cross wasn't weak, but rather was the ultimate expression of his power, of exerting his energy to come alongside us in our brokenness and in our helplessness, then we become willing to exert our energy to come alongside with him. Which is what then gives God the ability to transform us and, for, and to turn our afflictions into good. So no matter what happens, we are to put our trust in God. And, and we should be asking Him where He's at work and exerting our energy to come alongside Him so His will can be done, which means that the bad will be transformed into the good. But instead, sometimes we just like to look at the bad and say, man, that's bad. Shame on that bad. You know, there are days when wake up in the morning it's just a rainy, nasty day. That's a bad day, isn't it? Unless you're a farmer in summer, and then sometimes you need that rain. You know, and, and thinking about that, it makes me think about the, the life and the journey of finding God in the midst of our problems. You know, in the midst of, of struggles and, and things that we don't understand. 
You know, a rainy day can sometimes make me think about the suffering of the world and, and those who are facing great pain and loss. And I can think about the Christians who are being martyred uh, even now as we're, as, we're, as we're meeting together throughout around the world. Uh, it makes me think about, about wives who try and stay faithful to God when their husbands couldn't care less. Uh, it makes me think about parents whose kids are making poor decisions. About people who've made radical choices to serve God but things didn't turn out as expected. See, the journey of following God will be marked by those rainy days, by rainy seasons, and sometimes even by rainy years. And when you're in those dreary times, all you can see is the rain. All you can see is the gray and the nothingness, and the sun is nowhere to be found. It sounds like February, doesn't it? But those days are still part of the journey. The dreary seasons teach us that walking with God is not about stepping from one triumphant act to the next because life with God is not a ladder of continual ascent and success. Walking with God includes those ups and downs. You know, we, we learn a lot in our suffering. And I'm going to put suffering in quotation marks because to us, suffering looks different than suffering to a third world Christian. Uh, again, if you live in poverty at the, in the United States, you're still in the richest 1% of the world. We learn a lot from suffering. We're transformed in valley times. You know, many times we're told to just get over the dreary days, to rise above them as if they don't exist, just to, to use that terrible phrase that I really don't like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. To rise above them as if they didn't even exist. And basically that means that, that we tell those in, who are in bad marriages to just smile and move on. To tell those who are mourning the loss of a child, we say that there's, there's more important stuff to do than to, than to feel their deep sense of loss. To those who are failing at their jobs, to, to just get back on the horse and try again. And when we do this, we miss the fact that God is sitting with us in the darkness. And he's walking with us in the valleys and in the pain and in the failure and the loss. That's where God is. We want God to be in those retreat moments where, we, where we're surrounded by other believers going, yes, isn't this great? And we're raising our hands in worship and it's wonderful. But God meets us in the valleys. A lot of times in, in, in funerals, I will, I'll talk about the 23rd Psalm. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, in valleys... You know, the, the views are great from the mountaintops, but it's in the valley is where things grow. You get up high on the mountains, and all it is out in Colorado is just a whole bunch of snow. But you go further down, and it's lush and green. That's where things grow in the valleys. He's not waiting for us to get our act together so that we can walk out of the valley and up the mountain where the real action is. The fact is that the real action may very well be in the rain. Because we so often fall victim to the lie that our primary goal is to get out of the rain and into the daylight. You know, and if that's true, then Jesus was a huge failure and the cross was just a mistake. Because to the eye test, that doesn't look like success, does it? You know, if that same idea is true, then the Old Testament prophets, man, they really miss the point. If that's true, then, then the Apostle Paul was really, really not good at his job because his ministry ended up in a, jail, in a Roman jail after all. And jail after jail after jail and attempt after, on his life. You see, in the struggle, whether it's problems we face, whether it's unexpected circumstances or failure, we're forced to make new space for God that we wouldn't make when we are basking in the light of the mountaintop. And our ability to meet God in the difficulties shapes our hearts. And those who, who, who can't embrace, those who fail to embrace the difficult experiences become easy prey to future stress and struggles. Because honestly, they're probably not sitting with God in their struggle. And their hearts become hard through self-protection. And as a result, when future struggles come, 
When those challenges arise, they're unprepared and their hearts break apart. And often they break apart on other people. But those who learn to make room for the Spirit in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of problems, have hearts that are formed to break open. And when they break open in the realities of the struggle, they're able to share love with others. Romans 8.28 reminds us that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Again, that God is not the cause of the problems of the world that generate pain and suffering, but he brings good purposes out of them as he walks alongside us. God doesn't overlook our struggles, but rather he enters into it and he turns it for good in our lives. And that outcome, that good, may not be exactly what you and I want it to be. If it was, then everybody would be healed of every disease because we don't want to sit through that. We don't want to sit with people through that. But he turns it for good. You know, this is where the spiritual practice of lament can be helpful. We don't do lament very well unless we feel like we're at the bottom of the barrel. You know, the writers of the Psalms, they knew what it meant to lament, to see reality for what it is, and to long for deliverance, to cry out for God, to, for his kingdom to come, you know, for, for justice to be done on this earth. This isn't just mourning because we don't get our way or because something doesn't work out to, to the way I wanted it to. You know, this is about seeing the truth of the world and lamenting it. And sometimes instead of lamenting, we do one of two things. As a primary option, we whine and complain. You know, because, well, we're human. And all that does is cause us to play the victim. But a second option could be described as making lemonade out of lemons. We try sometimes to just make every day a Friday. We're told to look up when things are looking down. Sadly, though, we're actually trying to make things out to be better than they really are. And we refuse to enter into the pain of reality. And your reality is different from the person next to you, is, diff is different from their reality, which is different from the person next to them and their reality. That, that's why when, when, I see, um, when I see injustice in this world, Man, it breaks my heart. Uh, when, when, I see, um, when I see families torn apart, when I see injustice and people needlessly the victims of violence, it breaks my heart. And, and when I, do I agree with the looting? Absolutely not. Do I agree with the person's right to protest? Absolutely. Because their reality is different from my reality. Sometimes we refuse to enter into the pain of reality. And so what we do is we do things like make excuses. We work harder. We laugh sometimes. We, we medicate. We entertain ourselves to get our minds to not think about the realities that some people and even ourselves sometimes face. And sometimes we just cope. And of course, we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We put on our smiles, and we get back to our routines. And we do anything to keep from entering into the pain of reality. And that spiritual practice of lament can shape us to manifest God's life in ways that, that nothing else can. That God is with us in the struggle. God is with us in the pain. God is with us. And it causes us, that, that practice of lament, it causes us to break the pattern of just complaining and whining and playing the victim. Or just smiling and acting like, as if everything is just peachy keen. And what it does is it shapes us to depend on God. And I'm not sure that there's another way of learning to cry over what God cries about or to laugh about that which God laughs than to recognize reality. Sometimes surprise shows up in our lives. 
Sometimes surprise ha- happens. Sometimes things occur, and we're just like, you know what, I don't know what to do with this. And so we, we whine, we complain, we, we smile, we put on our Ken and Barbie face, and we go to church, hi, how are you, I'm fine, thanks, and you? And in reality, we need to recognize where we are. And we need to say, you know what, it is in those valleys where God wants to do his best work in my life. Because my, my path with Jesus isn't this straight line. You know, there are going to be some great experiences. And the views are going to be phenomenal from the mountaintop. But in the valley is where God does his best work. And so when surprise comes along, when surprise shows up, and we remember, hey, God works all together for, for you know, works in all things. God, God, in all things, God works together, for, you know, for the good of those who love him. Instead of God causing it, he's alongside of us. And he's going to bring about good. His good in our situations. God, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you are, um, that you're always present. No matter if we are in the valley or on the mountaintop, that God, you are, you are always alongside us. Help us to recognize reality sometimes. And help us to recognize, first of all, our reality and understand that our reality isn't the same as the person next to us. And help us to respect their reality and love them and come alongside them in the same way that you come alongside us. God, take our lives, take every part of us, whether that's 100% right now or maybe, like we said last week, sometimes all we have to give is is 70, 70 percent. But God, take what we, we give and continue to mold us and to shape us into the image of your son, Jesus. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We ask God, we ask that God would take all of our lives and make us into his image the image of his son Jesus, that image that did not exert power as control, but exerted power as sacrifice and humility and love. Let's sing together. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing, always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a Take my
Christian Church, 1944 South Jackson Street, Frankfurt, Indiana.